you're going to be sharing with children this summer the exciting stories that we find in God's Word. And these stories are relevant to the kids today, but these stories were written a long time ago. And the context of these stories were written in matters. A Bible scholar named N.T. Wright was writing about how context matters in when we're reading and understanding things. And N.T. Wright is a British uh, Bible scholar. And the example he gave was if a person said, I have a flat. The context matters on what that sentence means. It could mean two very different things, whether the person was British or whether the person was American. If the person was British and he said that sentence, I have a flat, he probably means that he has an apartment. But if the person's American and he says that sentence, I have a flat, he probably means that the tire on his car is flat and easily changed. So it's the exact same sentence, but it can mean two very different things depending on the context. And so when we're telling the stories from the Bible, we need to be aware of the context when these words were written, because it was a time very different from our own time. And the time that it was written in can sometimes form like a fishbowl. If you ever look through a fishbowl, the fish, everything inside is kind of distorted. And this is all those things, you know, back then, the culture of the time, things that they would have been aware of that we aren't aware of anymore and today. But we've got our own fishbowl here. Because we have our own culture, our own understandings of things, just like the American and the British had two different understandings of that sentence. And so when we're looking back at those Bible stories, it's like we're looking through our own fishbowl through another fishbowl. And so things can get confusing if we aren't very careful on how we read those words and we're thinking about the context those words are in. And uh, just throw some big words out here. The space between these two would be called a hermeneutical gap. Now, that's not a word you'll probably ever need to know, but it is sure fun to say. And the process of trying to get to what these words are by studying the culture and the context would be exegesis. And um, we can study you know, the words of the Bible, but sometimes to get context for that, we want to study the culture the Bible was written in, study the language, study what the time was like, and we can do that through archaeology, through documents outside the Bible that we can study, and it can help give us a richer understanding of the Bible itself. And then... To be able to take those words and they apply it to us today, that's where that word that we used before that I said, you probably don't ever need to know, but it's sure fun to say, it's hermeneutics, is how we apply those words today. But to be able to do that successfully, because we don't want to be putting our own understandings into the Bible that might have been foreign to what they understood, we need to understand the times and the context that those words were written in. And so I think I've got a fun way this week um, and next week as we go through to look at some of the culture around and surrounding the stories in the Bible. And what we're going to do is we're going to have a giant showdown between the God of the Bible and pagan gods. Because there's several confrontations we go through the Bible that God comes up against a pagan god. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you a secret, but I bet you guys already know the answer. God wins. <laughs> and what we're going to do is look at the gods and the cultures that worship these gods because the Israelites were living at the same time. So they would have been aware of what these gods stood for, what they meant. But us today, thousands of years later, we probably have never heard of these gods. We don't know what they stand for. And so that's what we're going to be doing to kind of take some of this away and to get down to what the words mean and to put those into context. And we're going to be starting in Exodus, but maybe a different angle than you usually look at this story. It's the story of the ten plagues. And so we're going to start here with God versus the gods of Egypt. And so in this very first match, we have God pitted against pagan gods. It's not just against one measly false god, it's against a whole pantheon. As you can see on the handout I listed you there, uh, for each of the plagues there's, you know, different gods, you know, possible that God was directed against. So you can check out Team Egypt's line there. So uh, before we get started, I'm going to look at Exodus 12, 12. And this was near the end of the plague story. And it says, on that same night I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, of both people and animals. And if you're familiar with the story of the ten plagues, you know what this is. This was the Passover where he was coming and he had warned them that if they didn't have the blood on the door, that he would come and would um, kill the firstborn. And he says that, I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. So not only were these ten plagues there to warn the Egyptians to let the people go, but he was bringing judgment on all the gods of Egypt as well. And so I do want to start with a disclaimer here. The Bible does say that these ten plagues are directed against all the gods of Egypt in general, but it doesn't call out any specific gods. 
So basically to do what I'm about to do is speculation, but sometimes it is fun to speculate and look at history and see you know, if that can enhance what we do know from the Bible a little bit. Uh, the Egyptians, and even the Israelites, because they were living near the Egyptians, surely would have known about these gods and what they were gods of. So when these different ten plagues happened, I'm sure they would have thought, you know, this god, you know, why weren't they helping with this? You know, if they're supposed to be the god of this, and that's what the plague was. So there definitely would have been, you know, things that they would have been aware of, so it helps us to be aware of them as well. The Egyptians' beliefs were very different from the Israelites' beliefs. And, of course, the Israelites is who we get our beliefs from, so very different from the beliefs that we have as well. In fact, the Israelites' religion was detestable to the Egyptians. And we see that also in the story of the plagues. And this is in verse 826. And um, here, Moses had asked Pharaoh, can we go out and sacrifice, you know, to God? You know, some of the plagues and Pharaoh was starting to break down, but we didn't want to let him go. So Moses was just asking, let us just go out and sacrifice and we'll come back. Well, Pharaoh didn't sure, wasn't sure he liked that. He's like, why don't you stay here and sacrifice? And Moses pointed out the problem with that. And in verse 26 it says, but Moses says, that would not, the sacrifices we offer the Lord, our God, would be detestable to the Egyptians. So um, the Egyptians, you know, looked at what the Israelites were doing, their religion, and they didn't like it. They thought it was wrong. They thought, you know, their ways was better. As the Israelites probably looked at the Egyptians and saw their many gods and saw the same thing. And so Moses pointed out, you know, it wouldn't work for us to stay here and sacrifice. We need to be able to go out and sacrifice because the Egyptians would find what we do detestable. The Israelites believed in one God. Whereas the Egyptians, as you can see, you know, there's many gods instructed again, believed in hundreds. Um, this is just a small sampling. Um, there were uh, lots of gods that the Egyptians um, worshipped. And through the plagues, the God of the Hebrews proved that the Hebrews' beliefs was superior to the beliefs of the Egyptians. Also, the God of the Israelites had always existed, and he had created the world. The Egyptians, they actually had stories about how their gods had been born. You know, it doesn't seem like very much of a god if your god had to be born. And they had, you know, even more than one story. We know how in Genesis 1, how God created the world. Well, the Egyptians thought they knew how their gods created the world, but they couldn't decide just one story. So there are several different stories that Egyptians told about how their gods created the world. One of the stories has um, four couples of gods getting together, and they create an egg. I'm not sure how they create an egg, but these four couples of gods create an egg, and the egg hatches. And out of this egg comes the sun. And the sun was the most important god to the Egyptians. And they called the sun Re. And once the sun had hatched from his egg, so he had just been born himself, he created the world. And that was one of the stories that they told them. But even their gods, they hadn't existed forever. They had stories about how their gods were born. The Israelites were slaves to the Egyptians. And maybe because of this, the Egyptians thought, you know, our gods must be better than that Israelites one single god because they're slaves to us. Why would a god that powerful allow them to be slaves to us if he really had that power? And so uh, they would uh, attribute, you know, a lot of times when an army defeated another army, they would assume it's because their god was more powerful than the army of the than the god of the army that they defeated. But. Uh, through the ten plagues, God showed the Egyptians how untrue that was, that he was less powerful because they were slaves to the Egyptians. And when Pharaoh refused to let them go, God afflicted Egypt with ten plagues, increasing severity. They started out, you know, just mild, but they got worse as the plagues went along. The first plague was to turn the Nile to blood. And the Nile River was an important river to the Egyptians because it was their primary source of water. It's where they got their water to drink. It's where they got their water to irrigate their fields. And the very first thing that God did was to turn the Nile to blood. But not only was it an important source of water, it was also a god to them. They worshipped the river just like a god. So they worshipped the sun, they worshipped the river, and they even had a hymn that they sung to the Nile. Just like we sing hymns to God, they were singing a hymn to a river. <laughs> And I've actually got one of the hymns that we have from thousands of years ago that they wrote to the Nile. It's been translated into English. I'm not going to sing it. For one, I don't know how they sung it. I, we found the words, but not, you know, how to sing it. 
Plus, you wouldn't want me to sing it anyway, because it would sound horrible. But the words say, When the Nile floods, offering is made to thee. Oxen are sacrificed to thee. Great oblations are made to thee. Birds are fattened for thee. Lions are hunted for thee in the desert. Fire is provided for thee. An offering is made to every other god, as is done for the Nile, with prime incense, oxen, cattle, birds, and flame. So as you know, the god that we worship, it might seem pretty silly that they're sacrificing and singing to a river, but that was one of their gods also, was just even the river Nile. In addition to worshiping the river itself, the Nile, they also had a god of the Nile named Happy. Just like, you know, the word like, oh, I'm so happy, but it's spelled H-A-P-I. And, you know, perhaps the Egyptians, when the Nile was turned to blood, they thought, you know, we have a god of the Nile, happy. Why did he let this happen? So we don't know for sure that it was directed directly against um, this god, but knowing that, you know, that the Egyptians had a god of the Nile, we can think, you know, well, maybe they were thinking that themselves, you know, he was sitting there and, this other god has turned your water to blood. You've got to be thinking, well, why didn't our god stop it if he's so much more powerful? And God was challenging the gods, and we see that. But he was also challenging the Egyptians' lifestyle and their whole belief system by taking something like the Nile. And the Nile is where they got their water to drink. And um, the frog was a symbol of life in Egypt. And God followed turning the Nile into blood by overwhelming the Egyptians with frogs. So he took something that was a good symbol to them, a symbol of life, and he made it where it made their life more difficult, where it was impossible just to do everyday things. The frog also represented Egypt's fertility goddess, Hekep. <coughs> and if you were to ask an Egyptian, where do babies come from? They wouldn't say a story. They had a story for that also. Um, the fertility goddess, Hekep, had a husband. Their gods also, you know, sometimes were married. And his name was um, Kanu. And so, Kanum would fashion the person out of dust on a pottery wheel. And once he had done that, it was Heket's job to breathe life into them. And that's where life came from, and people came from, according to the Egyptians. Uh, next, we see, you know, Aaron took his staff, and he struck the earth with his staff, and it says that the dust of the ground became gnats. And we aren't sure exactly what the gnats were, but they were some kind of bug that would have been a real pest. And the Egyptians also had a god of the earth. So he would have been in charge of the dust named Geb. And he was powerless to stop God from turning the dust into gnats. Uh, we have a plague also where it's a swarm of flies. And what's translated as a swarm of flies probably was a lot of different insects. It was just a swarm of um, insects. And with those might have been scarab beetles. And just like the frogs had an important place in Egyptian life, the scarab beetles, and you've seen any movie you've probably seen of, you know, they have the gold pennants that look like the scarab beetles, because it was a sacred beetle to them. And so again, it took a symbol that was good to them and inundated them with that, where they probably just got sick of it, something they were supposed to be important to them. They were like, oh, I'll get it away from me. Uh, the Egyptian goddess Hathor had the head of a cow, and the god Apis looked like a bull. A major distinction we see between the God of the Bible, the God that we worship, and the gods of the Egyptians, but not honestly the gods of the Egyptians, but as we go through this series in chapel, we're going to see all the pagan gods we can give a description for. Somebody has found out what they look like. They have a head of a cow, or they look like a bull. We can't describe our God. He's indescribable. That's one of the big differences. Anytime we see a pagan God, someone's been able to describe them. <coughs> But we can't describe God because he's indescribable. He's so much above anything that we could describe. And would you really want to worship a goddess that had the head of a cow? Um, and she was supposed to be the goddess of love and beauty. I don't know about you, but when I think of a cow, I don't think about beauty. And just to hint, you know, if you're going to pay a girl a compliment, I wouldn't tell her you look as beautiful as a cow. It's probably not going to go over very well. <laughs> And um, since she, you know, had the head of a cow, I'm sure the Egyptians were thinking that uh, the plague where their livestock began to die, their cattle, and again, this is their livelihood, their food to eat, they were wondering, you know, why can't our goddess, our cow goddess, protect our cattle from God, um, from the Israelites' God? And since Apis looked like a bull, the Egyptians revered bulls. If they owned a bull, they pampered it, they bathed it, they even threw their bull's birthday parties. Now, I know it sounds like I'm joking there, 
But um, I did read one source here. Once a year, they would parade the bulls out, you know, and take it around everyone and look at the bulls. If you want to call that a birthday party, I don't know what you'd call that. So they went through birthday parties for their bulls. And when their bulls died, they would mummify the bulls. And even today, you can go to um, Egypt, and they have hundreds of these bulls that are buried and uh, mummified. Um, in 1856, they uncovered a long tunnel underground. It had 64 large burial chambers with these large granite sarcophagi, and they were all bulls that had been mummified. So they really revered their bulls, and they, you know, preserved them. And so here their um, cattle, their livestock were dying. And, you know, they had a cow goddess, this bull that they worshipped, and neither were able to protect them. According to the Greek historian Herodotus, Egyptian priests shaved their entire body once a day. It was partially, you know, to keep lice away, because that was a problem, you know, so if they were shaved, they didn't have to worry about lice. And it was to be completely clean, completely pure. And they took baths four times a day, two times in the morning and two times at night. So cleanliness and purity to the uh, priests in Egypt was of utmost importance. And uh, they must have been hit really hard by these plagues. Very first plague is the Nile is turned to blood. If you have to take baths four times a day, I can't believe that was fun for them at all. I don't know if maybe they suspended that while that was going on. Um, but also, you know, we look at uh, the plagues that come next. Um, after that was the frogs. And then all the frogs died, um, the Bible tells us. So they had just big, huge piles of dead frogs. And if you're really concerned about cleanliness and washing all the time, you're probably going to want to be around all these big piles of dead frogs. After that, the gnats. Again, bugs. Something if you're you know, really concerned with cleanliness, you're going to want all these bugs all around you. And um, after that um, was the, uh, the nights, the gnats may have been like lice. And, you know, that's part of the reason that they shaved their bodies. And then there's the swarms of insects, and we're just talking about the first five plagues there. Uh, for the sixth plague, what uh, Moses and Aaron did is they picked up some soot, and they threw that soot up into the air, and then the soot just kind of blew out and spread over all of Egypt, and then the soot started falling down. When that soot would touch people, it turned into boils on people. So after all these first five plagues, now these priests that clean their cells and everything had soot coming down. I would think that would be a clean freak's worst nightmare. Once that soot got on you, it was turning into boils. They had a sky goddess named Nut, N-U-T. Um, and uh, she's depicted, whenever we see pictures of her, in like an awkward, I would almost call it like a yoga pose, She's standing on her tiptoes, and she arches her back over all of Egypt, and then her fingertips touch the ground as well. And actually, on your handout, that's what you have a picture of, is the god Nut, so that's kind of hard to describe. And that's how, whenever the Egyptians would draw her, she would be like that, because she was the god of the sky. Goddess, she was female. And uh, the, the whole point of this was that she was supposed to protect Egypt from anything that could fall on it. So the next plague, the hell... She should have been able to protect um, Egypt from the hell, but she was unable to protect them from the hell. She was powerless. The next plague, we're on to the ninth plague now, was darkness. And we already said um, that Ray, the sun, was their most important god. And not only that, um, Pharaoh was considered to be the son of Ray. So we said the plagues were increasing in severity, and darkness may not seem as bad as some of the plagues that came behind it, uh, before it, but to the Egyptians, this was a very severe plague because it was an attack not only on their gods, their most important god, but also on their pharaoh. And so now we're going to move into actually the showdown here and look at how God confronts these gods now that we have some background on the gods of the Israelites. Now, since this showdown is so long, uh, the story of the ten plagues covers about six chapters in Exodus. I'm not going to give a blow-to-blow -blow account of this fight between the gods. And if you want to get the whole fight for yourself... You can read it. You've got there at the top of the handout the passage where you find the story of the ten plagues. So in your devotions over the mornings or in your free time, you can read over that story. But I do want to draw some attention to some of the thematic elements that are common to all of the plague narratives that build up this story. The ten plagues are usually described as being divided into three groups of three. And that, of course, only um, adds up to nine. So we've got that last plague, but it's kind of set off to itself because it was a climatic. It was the big one that topped everything off, and it definitely was the most severe plague, the death of the firstborn. 
And the first three plagues, as far as we can tell from the Bible, it affected everyone. The Egyptians, the Israelites. But as we move into that second grouping, God even made a distinction. He said, these plagues are just going to affect the Egyptians. And the Israelites over in Goshen, which is the area of Egypt they were living in, weren't going to be affected by those plagues. Each plague narrative consists of certain elements, an instruction, an announcement, the magicians attempting to do the same thing, and then Pharaoh's heart is hardened. So let's go ahead and take a look at the first plague, which is in Exodus 7, 14 through 25. And I'll go ahead and read that and point some of those elements out as I come to them. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is unyielding. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he goes out to the river. Wait on the bank of the Nile to meet him, and take in your hand the staff that was changed into a snake. So there we have the instruction. God is telling Moses and Aaron to do something. Here he's telling them, you know, go to Pharaoh in the morning as he's going out to the Nile. And then it continues in verse 16. Then say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to say to you, let my people go so that they may worship me in the wilderness. But until now, you have not listened. This is what the Lord says. By this you will know that I am the Lord. With the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water of the Nile, and it will be changed into blood. So here we have the announcement. God actually announces, here is what I'm going to do. The fish in the Nile will die, and the river will stink. The Egyptians will not be able to drink its water. The Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron... Take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the streams and canals, over the ponds, and all the reservoirs, and they will turn to blood. Blood will be everywhere in Egypt, even in the wooden buckets and stone jars. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded. He raised his staff in the presence of Pharaoh and his officials and struck the water in the Nile, and all of the water was changed to blood. The fish in the Nile died, and the river smelled so bad that the Egyptians could not drink its water. Blood was everywhere in Egypt. But the Egyptian magicians did the same thing by their secret arts. So there we have that next part. The magicians in Egypt tried to do the same thing. And here they were actually successful. Though I'm not really sure what the point of being successful was. I think it would have been a lot more amazing if they could have changed the blood back to water. All they did was whatever little water they had left, change it to blood. That doesn't seem helpful at all. That seems the opposite of helpful. Um, and even... Then, they just definitely didn't have the breath. God was able to turn the whole Nile into blood. Whatever they did was just on a small scale. But they attempted to do the same thing. And then um, that verse goes on. Um, the magicians were able to do the same thing, and Pharaoh's heart became hard. He would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. Instead, he turned and went into his palace and did not even take even to this to heart. And all the Egyptians dug along the Nile to get drinking water because they could not drink the water of the river. And so there he hardened his heart. And not all of these elements are in all of the plague narratives. Um, there is no announcement before the gnats, the boils, or darkness, which is the third, sixth, and ninth plagues. And um, we see the gnats in 816. And... Um, there is no announcement here. It's just um, we see what Moses and Aaron are doing. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the ground, and throughout the land of Egypt the dust will become gnats. They did this. <coughs> so here God gave the instruction. They did it, and there were gnats. There was no announcement of what God was going to do. Now it's possible that Moses and Aaron went and told Pharaoh, but if they did, that's not recorded in the story. But a lot of the plagues have an announcement. Those were just three that didn't. The magicians weren't able to replicate all of the plagues. Actually, they were only able to do the first two. They were able to do the water into blood, as we already saw, and they were also able to do the frogs. But after that, the third one, which was the gnats, um, we see that they were unable to do that, and that's in 818. And it says, but when the magicians tried to produce gnats by their secret arts, they could not. And then actually after that, the magicians aren't in the next two plagues at all. And when it comes to the boils, it says they couldn't even come out because they had the boils as well. They couldn't stand because of the boils. And we see that in 9-11. And it says, 
The magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils that were on them and in all of the Egyptians. So we know why they didn't come out for this one. The two plagues before they didn't come out, I'm guessing they were just embarrassed, too embarrassed to come out. One element that is consistent that we have in every single plague that is talked about is that last element, that Pharaoh hardens his heart. Um, we get some kind of phrase there that um, Pharaoh hardened his heart or God hardened his heart after each plague. And Pharaoh having a heavy heart would have been deeply troubling to the Egyptians. Another belief that the Egyptians had was that when a person died, the gods would weigh that person's heart. And if the heart was heavier than a feather, which it seems like any heart would be heavier than a feather, but I guess, uh, but if the heart was heavier than a feather, then a fierce god would devour the person's soul. And so for them to hear that their Pharaoh had a hard heart or a heavy heart would have been deeply troubling for the Egyptians. And so we've looked here, you know, some of the context around these stories. We've looked at, you know, what the Egyptians believed about their gods, and we've looked at the story, you know, from that context. So let's go ahead and move to today. Is there something that we can learn about God? Because we know the Egyptian gods weren't real, so we won't really, you know, have much we can learn from them. So we're, what are they there for to teach us about the God of the Bible that we can know from them? I do think there's four things that I've got there that we can learn about the God of the Bible. And before we get to those, I want everyone to turn to Deuteronomy 7. And this is taking place after the plagues. So in Exodus, we we're you know, there with the plagues. This is taking place after the plagues, and they're looking back. They're remembering what happened here in Deuteronomy 7. And I'm going to start in verse 6 and read through to verse 11. It says, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the people on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. That's the story of the plagues. They're thinking back, you know, God saved us from that. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. But those who hate him, he will repay to their face by destruction. He will not be slow to repay to their face those who hate him. Therefore take care to follow the commands, decrees, and laws I give to you today. And sometimes it can feel like God has abandoned us. I'm sure the Israelites, when they were slaves in Israel, felt that God had abandoned us. Here the Egyptians are thinking their God's more powerful than our God. Maybe our God just abandoned us. He's left us here to be slaves to the Egyptians. I'm sure they were um, feeling more about themselves and feeling that God had abandoned them. And you may feel like there's no way out. But when you're feeling that way, remember that God created you and he loves you. Our God, you know, he was always existing. He wasn't born, and because of that, you know, he's always existing. He's the one who really did create the world and created us, and he loves us very much. And he's made us just like he wants us to be. And we see there in uh, verse 8, you know, but it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath, he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery. So the Egyptians felt like they were abandoned, but God cared about them, and he rescued them. And just like God cared about the Israelites, God cared about you. And whatever you're going through, you may feel like God has abandoned you, but he hasn't. He's going to help you through that because God cares about you. And then in verses 6 and 7 it says, you know, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people. And the Bible in the Old Testament tells that God chose the Israelites to be his special people. And to this day, you know, the Jews are God's chosen people. And um, most of us here, probably all of us, you know, we aren't Jews. We aren't in that, you know, group of chosen people. But God made, you know, a way in the New Testament for us to believe in Jesus and to have our sins forgiven. And in that way, God also chooses us. And God chooses you. And we also see specifically how he chooses individuals to do work for him. 
Uh, we didn't look, you know, in detail at all those plague stories, so if you do, you know, read all those six chapters in your own devotions or later. One of the things you might want to take note of is which stories Moses and Aaron have to do something for the plague to happen. Like God said for the first plague, you know, hold the staff out over the water, and then it'll become blood. But with the gnats, he told Aaron, you know, strike the ground with the uh, um, staff, and then the ground will become gnats. Some of them, you know, God just did it. You know, he didn't ask Moses and Aaron to do it. And he could have done that on all of them. But for some reason, he chose to work through Moses and Aaron. He decided to give them tasks. And the same thing with us today. God chooses to work through us. He's chosen to work through you this summer, you know, teaching kids. And God would have lots of ways to reach people for him. But we have the amazing, you know, gift of him choosing us to do that. So God chooses you. So if God cares about you, he's going to get you through things. And not only that, you know, he chooses you to work for him and to um, reach others through him. And verse 11, it says, Therefore, take care to follow the commands, decrees, and laws I give to you today. So we want to make sure, you know, this God that cares for us and has chosen us, that we're following him and not the other things that might, you know, I'm sure the Israelites were sometimes tempted, you know, well, the Egyptians, they've got all this going on, their gods, to follow those. But they needed to make sure that they accepted no substitutes, that they followed the one true God. And we need to make sure the same thing, because we might not have, you know, false idols or gods that distract our attention today, but we still do have other things that distract our attention, you know, all around us, you know, oh, that person's doing it, it looks fun, why can't I do that? But we need to accept no substitutes. We want to make sure that we're following God with all of our hearts. And um, finally, um, we'll look at verse 9 there, and it says, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. You know, there is none like God. And um, as we're looking, you know, these couple of weeks at all these other gods, we'll see, you know, they just don't measure up to our God because he is the one and only, and that's because he is the only one who is God. He's the one true God. So God cares about you. So when you're feeling down, just remember that. But also, God chooses you to go out this summer, and he's chosen you to do that. And accept no substitutes. Make sure you focus on him and follow him. And there is none like our God.